Welcome to Open Doc Lab's first virtual public talk. Uh, this is new for us, so please bear with us um, as we experiment and, and see how this works. Uh, we're going to have uh, the Open Doc Lab members as the panelists, so you'll be able to see them through the whole talk. And then if you have questions, just send um, a chat, a message through chat. And when we have the Q&A uh, section of the talk, I will um, read those and ask on your behalf. So thank you. Um, today we have Glenn Kantav and Idris Brewster. They are from Movers and Shakers New York City, which they co-founded. It's a nonprofit that uses augmented reality um, to explore and highlight underrepresented narratives in public spaces, in classrooms, in cultural institutions. Um, today they will talk about some of their uh, work and talk about the process and, and their motivations behind it. A little bit about Glenn and Idris. Um, Glenn is an activist, a performance artist, and a social entrepreneur. Um, past pieces include running the New York City Marathon in Chains, um, a slave auction pop-up AR exhibit, and a fast for the duration of Black History Month uh, 2020, calling for a more equitable blueprint for New York City. He's been advocating for equitable representation in public spaces for a long time, since 2017. Um, he was on the front lines of Charlottesville, Virginia, as a counter-protester um, at the Unite Against the uh, Right rally. Um, his photo of protesting in chains went viral around the world. Um, he has wonderful experience. Um, he is a Camelback Fellow, a TED resident, and former artist in resident at Ivy. So exciting to have him here. He's accompanied by Idris Brewster, who's an innovative and passionate uh, person who uses his technical and creative expertise to disrupt traditional narratives through immersive experiences. Um, before, his background is in cognitive science and computer science and education. He, as a creative technologist, he worked at Google um, and he spent, uh, uh, was part of a project developing an educational program called Code Next, which exposed black and brown youth to the world of computer science and allowed them to build and imagine their own future. Um, he's also very interested in hip hop production and filmmaking, and he was the subject of the wonderful documentary American Promise, which won the special jury award at the Sundance Film Festival. So wonderful to have you here, and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here, although virtually. We wish we could join you in person, but given the circumstances, we make the best with what we have. Um, and so, yeah, my name is Glenn Kantav. I'm the founder and CEO of Movers and Shakers NYC. And what we're going to go through today is um, a few of our projects, as well as the, the process in, uh, in terms of its development. But the main takeaway that um, I as an individual want you to, to walk away with is like the why, our intention for using AR. You, you know, in the past and especially in the future, you will see a flood of AR projects that are just using it for the sake of AR. Uh, we want you to know that, that we're in the middle of an R&D process to figure out the most effective uses of AR for consciousness, um, education, as well as protest. Um, so any sort of feedback that you have in terms of making it better by any means, that's the, that's the full intention. So just please have that in mind as we move forward. Okay. And so now the slides are being shared on the screen. Just bear with us one moment. Okay. Okay, great. So yeah, so we're moving the shakers and our mission is to use augmented reality as a tool to highlight um, underrepresented narratives to do this in public spaces and cultural institutions and of course in the public. So, and then anger for the talk, what I'd like to do is uh, provide a little bit of context in terms of videos that show why we do what we do. So the first video is the center of African thought. I promise you it's going to be the most boring part of the talk, and then from there it will get more interesting. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
why has the history of African peoples been erased? Well, we don't live in a fair world. Things aren't fair. You don't get equal opportunities. You get the opportunities that you create for yourself. And if someone gets in there first and they conquer you, they colonize you, they enslave you, they simply make your history disappear to make it look like they conquered, colonized, and enslaved nobodies. When people have a history, that makes you a somebody. So if you remove the history, you become a nobody. And so your history disappearing, nobody's lamenting the loss of that history. That's why conquerors, colonizers, and enslavers make the people whose history they've conquered, colonized, and enslaved disappear. There are psychological reasons why people would want to associate themselves with a history. There is a link between what someone thinks of themselves, what someone thinks of their people, and their history. Now, scholars talk about personal esteem. That means self-esteem. And then you have interpersonal or group esteem, which is what you think of your group or what you think of your race, racial esteem. Self-esteem and racial um, esteem. Okay, so that provides a bit of context in terms of like the higher level. And now this video will give a little bit of context into some of our activism and advocacy, and then we'll go straight into the project. Despite the fact that the majority of black and brown people are not physically in chains, we are still mentally in chains and metaphysically in chains. The rules of the constitution don't necessarily apply when we are murdered by authorities and get no justice. So we're still in chains. My name is Glenn Kantav, and I'm the founder and CEO of Movers and Shakers. We engage in a very visually provocative form of activism. I am 24 years old, and I'm based in New York City. In 2017, we're pretty much desensitized to a lot of violence and injustice. And so I believe that in order to push the meter forward for people of color, we need to make other people feel uncomfortable through a very visceral and visual form of activism. Charlottesville feels a world away. And so what I want to do with my team is to bring that experience right in your face and put you in that experience so that you feel it for yourself and you understand what this really means in a whole other way. The weirdest interaction that maybe I've ever had with a person was that one of the, I don't know if he was Nazi or KKK, he scurried around the side and he ran up to me, he screamed, fuck you, nigger. And as all this is going on, there's tear gas flying, someone threw a mailbox, there's just a lot going on. And so I do think it's important to put myself on the front lines and hear what they have to say, treat everyone with the basic respect of a human being. Because I know for a fact that they see me as an animal and they see me as a barbarian before I even open my mouth. So if I'm there just ready to punch him, what's that gonna do? I do believe that in terms of the technology of the future, VR and AR are technologies that can make people feel things in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily feel. But Movers and Shakers has gotten together a talented team to create an augmented reality book and tell a narrative in a way that's never been done. You have a series of different images. We created an in-house app. You take the app and you put it in front of the image and the app would play an animation in augmented reality. The existence of Columbus Circle in New York City and all monuments of hate are a concrete example that my life doesn't matter, that black lives don't matter, that brown lives don't matter, that if we go outside and we we're walking, minding our own business and we get killed by the police, that doesn't really matter. We're just black, black people. Okay, um, so we just go to the next slide. 
Okay, so in terms of the basis for what we're looking to do, um, it's all about redefining narratives. And so the professor from the Center of Pan-African American Thought in that first video said it pretty, pretty clearly that if you are colonizing people that are perceived as nobodies, it's, easy, it's simple to take away um, their resources. It's easy, if you dehumanize them, it's easy to take away their rights and it's easy to put them, essentially put them down. And so what we were looking to do in our campaign uh, to advocate for the removal of the statue of Columbus at Columbus Circle was to call out the hypocrisy that lies at the foundation of Western society as we know it. So in order to do so, you have to start at the origin. So genocide, patriarchy, white supremacy, all fundamentally started in the, in the Americas as a result of uh, Christopher Columbus and Western expansion. Even the name America itself is after an Italian explorer, Amer Amerigo de Vespucci. And so for us, it's not necessarily about, you know, attacking a statue just for the sake of attacking a statue because we're offended. It's the fact that systemic racism and oppression still exists to this day. And every stat in the book dictates that. And so if systemic racism wasn't a thing and, and these injustices were probably accounted for, then we would be working on other problems. But because it's not, we're doing this. So I just want to make that extremely clear from the get-go. And so in New York City, the statue of Columbus has been up since the year 1892. It's the second largest statue in, uh, in New York after Lady Liberty. And it's a symbol of hatred. And we really wanted to point out um, the hypocrisy that lies at the, the beginning. So if you look at you know every whether it's the fact that um well it's the fact that idris and i are haitian american right like christopher columbus came to hispaniola and and um uh, and saved the iraq people within four years 250,000 people were wiped out they made a decision that you know there's a thriving slave trade that's happening in east africa and because the arawaks were not resistant to the diseases that you know, people from, from Africa had to come over here. We're here as a result of that decision. Um, so it's a very personal battle for us, as well as a battle that hits at a lot of, uh, a lot of various intersections. Um, and so whether it's the hypocrisy of the fact that there are two people celebrated uh, with national holidays, Christopher Columbus or Dr. King, like legit enslaver and liberator, or the fact that our founding fathers did a lot of great things, but they also a lot of them owned other human beings and ingrained that twisted ethos into the moral fabric of our institutions, of our founding documents, of our founding laws, which persists to this day. The purpose was to highlight that injustice and unravel it in different ways. Um, a final contradiction I'd like to highlight is the fact that, you know, we're celebrating Thanksgiving and we think about the pilgrims. Um, but meanwhile, the other side isn't really shared in the stories. I remember when I was in first grade, we colored Christopher Columbus's votes, the Mina Pinta Santa Maria, never discussed the, the Taino slaves that were at the bottom of those boats and those boats were going back east uh, to Queen Isabella. Um, and so, and we know, we don't talk about the fact that the pilgrims didn't have visas, but you know, it's, it's all uh, a large moral contradiction. So that was the basis in terms of why we chose what we did. Um, now in terms of implementing augmented reality as a tool, um, we first came from the perspective of, okay, like we see this emerging technology uh, in terms of XR, VR, AR, MR as ways that can grab people's attention really quickly and can make people feel things in ways that um, they might not ordinarily see or engage. And so with VR, the problem is accessibility in terms of headsets. It's the problem is cost of production. And our problem was that we didn't have a large platform uh, to spread this message and we didn't have any money. Um, and so we wanted to use AR because uh, at the time, 83% of Americans had smartphones. It was cheaper to make. You could rapidly make content and spread it out very quickly. And we had a limited window of time to do so. Uh, and so just in terms of activism itself, you know, um, we've been protesting in similar ways that uh, for over a, over a century, um, whether it's the women's rights movements in the early 1900s or the civil rights movements in the 1960s, it's very much people like holding signs with names and yelling out, yelling out different chants and that's about it. But meanwhile, when you have the Ubers of the world disrupting, you know, 
how you got into a cab. You can get into a cab with someone you don't know and there's no exchange of actual cash. Um, you don't, they don't know the destination. The map tells you where they're going. Like there are these Silicon, Silicon Valley companies that are making billions of dollars disrupting how we behave in different ways. But that level of disruption isn't happening when it comes to life or death social issues. That seems to be the problem. So our intention um, isn't to say that we're coming up with the ultimate solution for it. But at least we're starting an R&D process that others can iterate on from there because uh, that needs to happen with life and death issues, point blank period. So in terms of how we apply this to our advocacy efforts, um, our first step was with performance art. Go, just go back real quick. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention we need to change the slide. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so the, the first step was as we were developing the, the AR content was just how do we get a lot of attention? So there was a a spot that opened up in the New York City Marathon um, six weeks out. There was this guy that I went to college with. He said, anyone want to do it? I was like, yeah, if I did it in chains, we could like add fuel to the fire of this conversation. Um, and it worked and went viral. Um, and so that was one example. Another example was we did a slave auction performance piece to tie into the genesis of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, as I mentioned, with Columbus coming in and enslaving others, people were like, okay, this is a good profitable endeavor. Let's do that. If you make this a black issue, uh, becomes a broader issue than just um, indigenous um, versus Italian American heritage, essentially. Um, and the space and the reason why we were able to do this was outlined in the video, really, because of the Charlottesville riots. Um, Charlottesville showed the contention that exists when people um, are threatened with um, alternative versions of history that might not mirror their own initial perception. In this case, people came out with machine guns and arranged in military formations and Heather Hare died um, as a result. So it's a really serious issue. Um, and that translated into Mayor de Blasio in New York City, deciding to make a committee in terms of which monuments would go up, which ones would go down, uh, what's problematic, what's not. And there's a huge problem in New York City. There's 155 statues of men, six statues of women, and there's 23 statues of animals, which is absolutely absurd. And the end result of this actually was that they removed one statue. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but that was the, the basis of it. Um, you go to the next slide. And so it's, um, so it's uh, yeah, that's me, that's Idris. And um, our partner, Micah, Micah Milner, is, um, he works with us full time as well. He's our chief creative officer and co-founder. Um, and so, yeah, so now we're gonna go into like the specific projects and why we do what we do. So the first thing that we started working on was an augmented reality book and installation on the true story of Christopher Columbus. And going back to the intention of why AR, the reality is that there are really thick books that give appropriate nuance and context to this history in, in a way that should be accessible to all aside from a library. But like the reality is that if a teacher is not forcing you to do it, or if you're not getting paid to read this information, you're probably not gonna read it. Um, and that's fair, as life is complicated and people have other things to do. So the reason why we saw value in augmented reality is that we could use this as a tool to distill information from those thick texts that most people do not read into something that's visually compelling and that's simple and that takes only a little bit of time to get through and engage with and you walk away thinking, hmm, I didn't know some of these things. So whether it's the fact that when Christopher Columbus was the governor of Hispaniola, Haiti and DR, and he wrote in a letter to Spain that um, nine and 10 year old girls were subject to sexual slavery, or that if you were over 14 years old and you didn't bring the appropriate, appropriate rations worth of gold, he would cut off both of your hands. Or the fact that he was literally imprisoned um, on the authority of the Spanish government because they realized he was being too cruel to the people of Hispaniola. These are facts that are not common knowledge to most people. And so if we can make it simple and effective and make sure that everything's academically verifiable, we see real value there in terms of putting this in, uh, in galleries. We have, have these, we feature these in pop galleries, uh, festival, uh, different festivals. We've done them, uh, we've done street art, street, street demonstrations uh, where communities of color are engaging with the technology for the first time in different ways. It's really just about spreading the word um, in a really effective and compelling way. So it's, it's a little bit more than just, you know, having people share uh, a face filter of a rainbow throwing up. We want 
we think that, you know, at the end of the day, if it was about Spider-Man, people would still probably come want to see it. But if there's a mission behind it, then we can really do something here. So that's, that's the first project. So nationwide, there's 5,100 statues of people. There are 718 Confederate monuments of uh, figures that would have owned people like Idris and myself. And there's 394 statues of women. That's less than 10%, which is absolutely absurd. Now, on the other side, there are countries that have really taken care of this issue in meaningful ways. This issue, not just in terms of just statues, but in terms of portrayal of the truth and narratives in really meaningful ways. So um, December 2018, I gave a TEDx talk in Belgium uh, talking about this work. And this lady came up to me after and she said, this is really cool, but have you heard about the World Museum of Central African Art? I said, no, what's that? And she said, long story short, it was known as the most racist museum in all of Europe. And um, they threw some, something that kind of like 60 to 70 million dollars at it after they closed it down because it was racist. And after five years, they reopened it. And on the day I gave the talk, they was the day of the grand opening. And so the next day I got on a train to Brussels and I went and this museum, this museum added nuance and context in a way that America can only dream of and it should be, it should model after it. They spoke about how, they showed ex exhibitions that clearly showed how they had colonization down to a legitimate science. Like if you, uh, Belgium uh, colonized Burundi, uh, Congo and Rwanda, as well as other areas in Central Africa. And if you wanted to be a colonizer and administrator in that area, you had to go to a colonized university for four years. And so the exhibit showed uh, and explained how you would have to take different classes in terms of uh, law and administration, how they made sure you were physically fit. And after four years of colonizing university, you were ready to go out and go ahead. They talked about how they had in people that were indigenous to those areas, um, like in exhibits as if they were zoo animals to dehumanize them and make it easy to take things away from them. Um, they, they talked about how King Leopold, responsible for killing, you know, close to 60 and some uh, other estimates, 80 million people uh, was praised and how it's problematic. Um, so whether it's, whether it's that case or the case of Belgium or the case that, uh, you know, people who were impacted by the Holocaust received over $60 billion in reparations from the German government over the last uh, 80 years. Um, other countries have addressed these issues in extremely meaningful ways. Even in Berlin and Germany, you can't go more than 100 meters without seeing a plaque of a family that um, was kidnapped by the SS. And rightfully so, they should, they should acknowledge that history. But in the United States, you see the, with the issue of monuments, it's absolutely absurd. We're not even talking about changing museums at this point. We're talking about a situation where you are opted into, you're, you're not opted, you're, you're forced to confront someone that would have enslaved, enslaved you and look up at them. And these are legitimate tools for oppression. The reason why we say that in terms of optics comes from number one, a philosophy of what you see and what you hear impacts your mind as what you eat impacts your body. But also if you look at the numbers between the uh, 1950s and the 1960s was when the majority of the 718 Confederate statues were erected. And that was around the same time when the Jim Crow laws um, enforcing segregation were in full blast. Um, so it's really contentious to get rid of these monuments and it's really expensive to erect new ones. And so we were like, okay, with augmented reality, we have a way that we can do this. So we go to the next slide. So this is the Monuments Project. It is a collection of augmented reality monuments of women, people of color, and the LGBTQIA plus community. And this is our response to essentially government inaction and inefficiency. So going back to the New York City case, as I mentioned, they removed one statue um, and they're planning to erect uh, 10 statues um, 10 female statues, um, which is a good start. As I mentioned, when you have 155 men and six women, that doesn't really do much to address that discrepancy. And it's also a long bureaucratic process. It costs a million dollars per monument. And so cost is a prohibiting factor uh, there as well. With our monuments, um, 
We can make hundreds for the price of one traditional statue, uh, make them any size, anywhere. Some of them animate and we can do it with permission and working with uh, the government or certain institutions, or we could just do it. And so if you look at Colin, the image of Colin Kaepernick here, um, go to the next slide, you can see it better. So on the right hand side, you can see you can point and shoot at, uh, with our prototype point and shoot at uh, the New York City subway map and it just pops up like that. Or you could do it um, with a Starbucks cup like that. Um, so there's a lot of different ways um, where you can address these narratives in meaningful ways. And so our vision is to make like a, a woke version of Pokemon Go. There's one guy called it Wokemon Go. We're gonna run with, with that name. Um, so kind of wanna do like a Wokemon Go scenario um, because we see real value, real value in having people engage with history that resonates with the rich diversity of our city and the rich diversity of our country, because we are not nobody at this point, period. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, over time, um, our goal, and Aegis will speak to the uh, technical aspects in a bit in terms of how we're looking to execute, but we could put them anywhere. So you have, it would make sense to have someone like Shirley Jism at the Lincoln Memorial, you can shoot, you see her. Next one. Or uh, Tupac Amaru in Central Park. Next one. Oh. Okay. So, um, or if you look here, you have Toussaint Louverture. It's also my background right there. Um, and so our vision over time is to build up this catalog of women, people of color, the LGBTQIA plus community, and not just have us be, um, not just have us uh, monopolize cultural capital in this way, but then to open this up in different ways. So right now, um, you know, it's three straight, straight dudes running a nonprofit that are doing this, right? But like, we can't speak to the experience of a trans woman of color. Um, and so what we wanna do is um, once we get the appropriate resources to build out this catalog, we also wanna have an open RFP for interactive artists and interactive stakeholders, um, interactive artists, stakeholders, uh, librarians, historians to come together and really figure out whose stories should be told, how they should tell the story and center the appropriate voices. Because to re-monopolize uh, doesn't make any sense. We'd just be reinventing oppression in different ways. So we're not interested in doing that. Um, so before I finish this portion of the talk, I wanna leave you with one story um, that speaks to the impact of what we're looking to do. And that is the story of Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution. So Toussaint Louverture was born as a slave and he was one of the people that jumped in and started the Haitian Revolution. So um, if you're unfamiliar, you know, after Columbus took over everything and Haiti was a slave state, the slaves got together, they said, we're going to take this over, we're going to die trying it. And he emerged as a leader in this revolution. And um, he was assassinated before they achieved full liberation. Uh, but as a, as a martyr and as a major figure, the impact of the ha Haitian revolution has had a ripple effect in terms of contemporary state formation in both North America and South America. So the revolution ended in 1804, but in 1803, France was standing on its last leg and their economy was crippled as a result of this insane revolt that had lasted at least 10 years at this point. And so Napoleon needed money and he needed it quick. So Thomas Jefferson saw an opportunity, he approached Napoleon and he said, we will buy Louisiana from you. And at the time, Louisiana wasn't the state in the, by the Gulf of Mexico at the time. It was half of the, it was the, it was about the size of the continental United States at the time, like the 13 colonies. So it doubled the size of the country um, and that wouldn't have happened without the, the Haitian Revolution. Now, if you go down to South America, Simon Bolivar um, was known as like the Grand Liberator. He was doing his own revolt uh, against the Spanish. And what he was looking to do um, was essentially like make his, make his own thing and not answer the Spanish again. And so they went up to Haiti and they said, look, we, we know that you know how to do this. How do you help us? Can you support us? And the Haitians opened up their constitution and they said, if you look 
at our constitution that says that if you step on Haitian soil and you are black, you are free. We don't do slaves. So if you're, if you're down to abolish slavery, we will support you. Bolivar said no problem. And the end result was by the end of Bolivar's revolution, uh, new countries came up, um, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, um, in this new place called, called Gran Colombia. And so this impact would not have happened without the support from Haiti. Now, the reason why we're sharing this specific story is because this is one story among tens of thousands that aren't being told in the classrooms when you're a kid. They're not in the public spaces. They're not necessarily in the media. They're starting to become a ripple effect. It's nice that Madam C.J. Walker, um, her story's out now out on Netflix, great. But the real value that we could see bring, be seen bringing to the table is that people know these stories as common knowledge. And that instead of dehumanization, we are rehumanizing groups of people that have been traditionally marginalized and had resources taken away from them. And so our ultimate goal is to promote a new culture of public consciousness that's centered in augmented reality, that's centered in empowering people by having them be exposed to technologies that they wouldn't ordinarily see. The next Black Gates could be a 12-year-old Black girl that lives in public housing. Bill Gates has been coding since he was a kid, but if she doesn't have exposure to that technology, then it's not going to happen. And the reality is, when it comes to kids, they're going to blow us out, out of the water with this thing. But it first starts with exposure, exposure to a history that resonates with them, and exposure to stories that can rehumanize us so that we all know what's going on. So that 10 years from now, whether it's through individual actions or how we move with the ballot box, we move with the appropriate information. So that's what it's about. Okay, um, so I'm going to really talk about the art uh, real quick, and then we're going to step into the technology realm and education portion of the talk. Um, but for us, um, the visuals are extremely important to portraying the message that we have. Um, we are giving people really visual form of activism, a visual form of condensing information, uh, and then people are going to be interacting with these things at a very close uh, personal level. Um, and so we really want to, we need to really need to approach these pieces of art with care, especially when we are portraying the lives of such important people of color. Uh, and so with the invention of VR programs like Quill and Tilt Brush, uh, they have really allowed us to approach these monuments like 3D animated oil paintings. And it really gives them these sculptures an organic and approachable feel that people have really been enjoying. Uh, and it's one of their favorite aspects of the experience. Um, and these programs allow us to create our AR experiences in a VR headset. Uh, VR may not be accessible for people to experience as a medium, uh, but for creators, it gives us unprecedented access to tools that allow us to really create very fluidly in a digital space. You see them painting here like they're painting in real life. Um, and so it really gives us a different approach to, to the creation of these um, art pieces that we've never, that are really unprecedented. And so creators are in kind of a new digital age with these VR tools. Uh, and so each of our monuments that you've seen before are created with individual brush strokes through a spatial realm like, like Tilt Brush or Quill. Um, and so as for our tools, we've really been using Quill mainly because it's a program that allows us to create, to not only create the static art, but also animate it. Uh, and so a lot of our workflow is actually just in a headset. Uh, and when we're bringing it out of the headset, it goes right into a program like Unity, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and so this new workflow is something that's very cutting edge and very new. And so we're running into a lot of problems with it, but also uh, just make, covering a lot of ground. And so the Monuments Project uh, and the uh, Augmented Reality book were some of the first outward facing experiments with AR uh, that we had. And so to start out, we used the, one of the easiest forms of AR, which is image recognition. I'm sure some of you are aware of it, um, and it's really pretty much one of the most supported uh, and easy to use applications of AR. Uh, and the tools are very simple. You use something, you use Unity, which is a gaming, a uh, video game engine, uh, and Vuforia, which is kind of like a plugin or an add-on, uh, which brings the image recognition algorithms and technology into that. And so once you have your 3D models created, you can really use Vuforia to put the images that you want into the app, uh, into the database. And so how it works is that 
Euphoria will recognize only certain images. Um, like the computer vision is not like human vision. Uh, humans can really recognize very simple objects, very simple shapes and very simple images. Um, but with, with um, computer vision, it needs very complicated images. It can't just, it's not going to recognize a video of a Nike check uh, or video of a regular box. I think it needs a lot of lines, contours, edges, shapes. If we go and look at some of like Jackie Robinson, the third one over here, you can see that that image has a lot of different lines, contours and different jumbled and distortions. And so we've really gotten down a process ourselves of like distorting a bunch of images, adding different lines, just to make sure that the computer can recognize them. Um, let me go back here. Uh, and so, but for the future of, oops, but for the future of our Monuments Project, we want it to be one, a walking tour where people can walk around the New York, New York City and see it. And so having images that they need to point at really, hinders our accessibility. But also, we want people to be able to access this in their homes, uh, wherever they are, without potentially having to travel somewhere, since accessibility is a core tenant of ours. And so uh, we are playing around and experimenting with the two, um, two other forms of AR, uh, which is tabletop recognition uh, and geolocation. Uh, and so for tabletop recognition, the phone is used as a tool to basically recognize the world around it. You can point your phone at your floor, at your table, at your wall, basically any flat surface, horizontal or vertical. Uh, and so using this information, the computer will understand the world around you, understand that there's a table in front of you, understand there's a floor. And then once it recognizes that, it can place these digital objects, whether you've created in Tilt Brush, whether it's, um, whether it's video, audio, uh, or text, you can place that on top of those um, specific planes as if we were there. And so every action from then on out will be recognized these surfaces as the ground. Uh, and so that allows you to anchor experiences anywhere. And that's really one of the most accessible parts of AR. If someone wants to see a sculpture that's only available at the Met using AR app, they can bring that right into their living room. Um, but as for the public aspect uh, and the public portion, especially for public education, uh, that's a little bit more difficult. And so we would like to, we're exploring geolocation because our vision is to turn the city into basically a digital play, a virtual playground from history where people can interact with these narratives of specific, specifically from people of color, whether they're at Federal Hall downtown or at Central Park uh, up on 59th Street. And so the, for geolocation, the phone is using geographical coordinates, longitude and latitude to center the experiences. And so when, let's say, for, for example, at uh, Columbus Circle, it can understand that the, cor the coordinates of Columbus Circle. And so whenever you walk into that area with the app, uh, it will trigger the experience if you're at that physical location. No pointing uh, at a certain thing required. Just plot your phone and it will be there. But the problem about working with um, cutting edge technology, especially stuff with geolocation, which, which requires a lot more backend coding and a lot more lo uh, geolocative algorithms. Uh, the technology is not there yet. This is probably the most um, nascent version of AR, uh, the, mo the, less, the least perfected one. Uh, and so let me, for example, like when we've been testing out this technology, if we want, we've been testing out, at, let's say Columbus Circle, uh, and if we go to that location, it's not gonna be the most accurate. Um, the, the, the statues, the experiences might load across the street, it might load down the block. Uh, and so we're really waiting on the actual infrastructure of, the, of AR um, for, uh, for the future, especially with the adding, adding on of 5G and edge computing. Um, those will definitely help these experiences be more seamless uh, and more able to scale uh, at a large, at a large um, rate um, so everyone can access that. Um, so that's definitely the future is having us have these walking monuments tours where people can experience it around the city, um, but we're working towards that. Um, and so with all of that in mind, we really wanted to focus, um, we're focusing a lot on public education, but what's also extremely important to us is actually getting into the ground level of education. And so that 
really off the path there was getting our experiences and creating a different module for schools and classrooms. Um, me, myself, I was an educator before Google Movers and Shakers. I was working as a computer science educator at, a, at Google Code Next, which was an educational program that works with high schoolers of color, a free program that works with high schoolers of color around New York City to build the next generation of black and Latino tech leaders. And so we had a makerspace that offered these kids STEAM programming, uh, kids who had, and we really prioritized kids who had never been exposed to this technology um, and kids who were just eager to learn. So entrance into the program wasn't based off of merit. It wasn't based off of coding skill. It was strictly based off of how enthusiastic you were in the preliminary test that we were giving. Uh, and if you just brought and if you just brought all of that energy and all your a game and so we had a real plethora of students uh, and so working out of this makerspace at Google NYC I was really I was able to teach coding design and leadership uh, to black and Latinx youth uh, and to start off we used the lens of computational art because that was a very approachable medium for the kids to come into uh, it attached them onto something that they knew um, so whether they were creating video games, creating music videos, a lot of the, we had one course that I taught, which was uh, Python MC. And so we were teaching them how to create rap videos using Python, uh, rap songs and beats. Uh, and so really the most important thing I was able to do with my time there was really allowing these kids to be able to see a future for themselves in computer science. Uh, so often a career in computer science and technology seems unattainable for kids of color. Uh, so as a student myself, I didn't see computer science as something that I could partake in. Uh, but sooner or later, I was exposed through the privilege of being able to go to universities and uh, high school that had this available. But not everyone has that opportunity. Uh, and so this is what we have to do really moving forward is expose these communities of color to the technologies of tomorrow uh, so that we can cement our spot in building, in, building our future. Uh, I feel like a lot of times we're being written out of the future. If you look at a lot of sci-fi, look at a lot of science fiction reading and movies, uh, and a lot of just world building in the future in general, it really uh, d doesn't include a lot of people of color, a lot of perspectives from that angle. And so uh, we really have to do a lot of work in order to make that a reality. Uh, but as a computer science educator at Google, I was really, ex I experienced firsthand the value that can be gained from exposing them to these new, exciting, emerging technologies of tomorrow. Uh, and so that was the inspiration for us going into creating a classroom version of our monuments experience in those narratives. And so while working my a with my AR on the side, uh, while at Google, I was really able to bring the kids in our process, uh, movers and shakers for creating AR to tell underrepresented stories. And so it was there that we realized the power and the value of the tool for engaging kids in the classroom. It's accessible, it's cost effective, it allows under-resourced schools the opportunity to constantly update content uh, without having to buy a plethora of new books. Uh, it's a very easy, simple way to do it. And the kids were just, the rea reactions from the kids was um, so great. They just wanted to learn more. Uh, they wanted to know what was going on. They wanted to learn more about the content. And so we saw that, a light bulb t uh, switched, and we, ran, we, went, we ran with it. And so earlier in 2019, we won the Verizon 5G Ed, Ed Tech Challenge. Um, that was a national open call for creative applications of 5G technology uh, to increase engagement in the classroom. Uh, the grant ended up for us getting us around almost half a million dollars. And so it really allowed us to really expand on our ideas and bring them to a forefront in a very powerful way with a lot of resources. Because uh, before this, we were really strapped for resources and that really stifled our creative output. Uh, and so we finished their product accelerator uh, and have completely finished version one of Unsung, uh, the MVP version of Unsung. And so Unsung is a multiplayer augmented reality learning experience that highlights the, that highlights the experience of women musicians of color that use their platforms to overcome adversity um, and advocate for social change. Um, and so the platform we built for Unsung provides a really a completely new way to position narratives in AR. Um, we've created something called an AR story box, which you see right here. Uh, and that's kind of a digital narrative sculpture that we have that 
it's look I would think of it as like a digital dollhouse the si and it's actually the size of the dollhouse and so kids would interact with it on their tables uh, in their classrooms in groups of four and so they would be take open the app point it at the table and they would spawn this digital um, dollhouse um, also view it as an escape room and so each of these sculptures would line up with one figure story and so in this first module we had four stories and so each of these story boxes had four different parts in it. And so each of these was four different rooms where kids would have to actually solve puzzles, go inside the room. And once they go inside the room, it's kind of like teleporting into time. And they would be able to experience moments in these figures' life as if they were there. And so um, this app was created for sixth to eighth grade English students. And these students can read passages that align with common core standards uh, and answer multiple choice questions uh, in our app. Um, sorry, these, the app would be um, partnered with a reading book. And so the kids would read the, question, read the um, passages in that book and then bring them, and then from there we bring them into the app to answer these questions. So we thought it was important to, um, to really pair the physical with the digital so we can pair things with the students that are already comfortable with and they already know. And so correct answers to these questions would unlock our AR story box. Uh, which I said before provides visual elements to each figure story. And so students can really peel back the layers of time uh, and teleport into these specific scenes throughout history as if they were there. This is the March on Washington that students could, peel, uh, could jump into. And while they're in these rooms, they would be solving different puzzles, unlocking different tools that, to interact with the scenes and animated figures um, as if it were like a video game, sort of, a video game of learning. And so we see it as a form of edutainment. Um, and so it's really a new narrative format where we're meeting kids where they're at with their media intake, um, from, especially from working so closely with students uh, of middle school and high school age. I, re I really saw that students primarily are interacting visually with their information in social spaces, uh, including video games, social media, TV, et cetera. And so AR really allows them to explore historical and educational content, but in a similarly engaging and visual manner. And so the kids were really just struck with the visuals and really into the reading like never before. Um, but just the reading on its own through a lot of our user research was not something that was, was exciting the students, that was making them excited to learn and move forward but allowing them to explore that reading in a visual manner, just like a video game that they do at home with their friends. And on top of that, in a collaborative manner where they're solving these puzzles with their friends, with the time, um, with um, some time, uh, it really took the whole dynamics to another level. And so really bringing the interactivity of things like AR and VR to the educational and, and social spaces uh, really offers a better and more efficient way to disseminate information. Uh, that will really stick in the students' heads. Um, and even outside of the classroom, if you bring it to a gallery form, if we bring it into in-home experiences, the immersivity is just unlocking uh, and bringing the attention of more neurons in the brain that um, will make for better learning. Uh, and so back to Glenn. All right, so to finish up the talk, what I wanna do is highlight um, so we spoke about the public spaces aspect, we spoke about the classroom aspect, and now we wanna talk about the tangible impact that we're going for. Um, so one big thing that we're, we like to focus on is that we don't just do art for the sake of art, but we're looking for a tangible impact on the back end. Um, so this was a performance piece that I did with a goal of uh, tangible impact on the, end, on the back end. So. Uh, for Black History Month 2020, um, stopped eating, did a water fast, and was in Times Square all day. And um, I had shackles on each leg. One said 1492, alluding to Columbus. The one, the one said 2020. Um, the idea is that it's pretty much the same thing, regardless in terms of oppression, which is with different manifestations of oppression. Now, the idea was in New York City specifically, we wanted to call for a more equitable blueprint because the past was designed without the best interests of oppressed people in mind, and they're doing the same with the future. Uh, one, just one fact that illustrates it pretty well is the fact that for every homeless person, 
uh, that is in New York City, there are three vacant apartments. Um, and there are you know, many stats that complement this as well. Um, and so the idea in terms of what we were looking to do was to first call upon the fact that we're in this massive uh, tension economy where uh, whether you look at my screen, you look at Times Square, all the billboards, or you look at your own computer, everyone is vying for your attention, distracting you in different ways. And there are entities that are still taking away your rights uh, to privacy, security, um, and fulfillment in different ways while you're being distracted. So the intention of the fast was to pause um, in the middle of this, of the center of the attention economy and to call on different community leaders um, and people from all walks of life essentially uh, to come together and to think of a more equitable blueprint for New York City. So we go to the next slide. So we got really great support. People came in solidarity um, all throughout the day. Um, AOC shared it on her story. Um, and it was, um, it got a good reception. But, the re but what we're looking to do with this momentum, um, granted it was slightly slowed down because of the COVID epidemic, um, but the intention is still there and I'll get into that really quickly. Let's go to the next slide. Next one. Just for the sake of time, I'm gonna breeze through. Next one. All right, yeah, so basically what we're looking to do is um, we're interested in exploring the idea of a referendum in New York City. So for those of you who are not familiar with the ballot initiative, the idea is that like in traditional representative government, um, the representative body, whether it's Congress or the city council, um, comes together, writes and votes on laws, the executive decides to sign in on the law, and that is the law, but you need to, you need to be a representative to have that power. Meanwhile, with a ballot initiative, the power goes directly into the people where there's a question on the ballot and it's, are you in favor, are you not? And then that becomes the law, plain and simple. Um, now it's hard to do. Um, in New York City, you need 50,000 pen and paper signatures to make that happen. Um, and they make that hard intentionally because they don't want the people to have this type of power. And so three questions that we're exploring um, are what I'm gonna go through here. Um, but this feeds into the fast because the idea was to call people together to have sort of like a constitutional convention for the New York City Charter, which is like the um, constitution, but for New York City, where everyone from artists, activists, lawyers, workers, teachers, students came together and brainstormed. And so three questions that we're looking at are the following. First is a cultural heritage commission. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I'll be quick for the sake of time here. Basically, the idea is that like it's a response. It's a response to um, Mary de Blasio's idea that one statue was enough to remove. So it's basically running back this monuments commission, deciding what goes up, what goes down once again in terms of street names, in terms of holidays, in terms of monuments. Um, textbooks is still TBD because that's more of a state level. Uh, but the idea is giving people veto power. So let's say the Monuments Committee decides Columbus Circle stays up. If you gather X amount of signatures, that question actually gets deferred to the ballot instead of the city and the executive having the final say. And then people can vote on what happens in the next municipal elections. Um, and so the reason why this is so important right now is because um, it speaks to broader implications in terms of a check to power in democracy in a way that hasn't been done um, in a way that's not commonly practiced in the United States. So this can seriously serve to broader implications. So that's one. Um, the next is community restorative justice. We're calling it community personhood. You go to the next slide. So um, the idea is simply that corporations can sue people. Um, and so communities can't do that. Like they, like they actually have personhood. And so the idea is that um, we wanna give the communities power to sue corporations for damages that have been done to the community along the lines of um, environmental damages, um, what you call it? environmental damages, gun rights, uh, gun violence that, uh, violations and different elements of structural racism. Let's go to the next slide. And so we're not reinventing the wheel here. This is a practice that's being done um, in New York City right now, where the mayor is suing um, in oil companies 
for damages that came as a result of Hurricane Sandy, because the argument is that if you knew this was going to happen, you had played an active role in producing a natural phenomena like, like, uh, like Sandy, then you should foot the bill and not us. But what we are proposing is that that power be decentralized to communities so that the stakeholders and members of the communities have an exact say in where this money is going um, rather than someone with so much power. And so New York City is divided into 59 different community districts. And the idea is that we would, uh, if we were to change, successfully change the law, each district would have its own lawyer, which would be democratically elected and serve as a community advocate. And they would have the power to sue for damages in different ways. And so just to illustrate the example, um, the idea is that like Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn has been a neighborhood that has been traditionally over-policed. And so what we want to do is take uh, the income of Greater New York City as a whole, let's say between a 10-year period, and you put a number to that. And with that number, like a percentage of that would have gone to, you know, making the parts cleaner, making the schools, improving funding for the schools, um, like just making the community, giving, giving the community a higher quality of life. But if an area has been traditionally over-policed for crimes that are nonviolent drug offenses that will be legal within the next year or two, um, some are legal now, or if you're in a cage for, by mistake, like this money is not being put into those communities. And that ripple effect has been felt by that community over the course of many years and it's not being accounted for and there's no mechanism to account for it. So we want to put that into play in place um, so that whether it's, whether it's Bed-Stuy, whether it's Brownsville, whether it's the South Bronx, wherever, anyone that has a legitimate legal claim in any of those 59 districts would be able to do that. And so let's say that, you know, you put a number to that, the money comes back, then there would be an open request for proposals process where it's, if you have a good idea for a vertical farm, a women's STEM education center, Boys and Girls Club, whatever that may be, if you are a resident of bed you decide what happens with that money. So that's the idea. And then um, the third one, uh, it it's, uh, becomes more relevant, especially given what, where we're at. So we believe that like, you should be able to vote from home. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with the upcoming elections, but the, the way that the law is written, um, it, it accounts for hacking in the sense that um, you know, if you have a voting machine or device that receives external data, it's easy to be hacked, right? And so what we wanna do is uh, just create an exploratory committee to see whether or not blockchain, uh, voting on the blockchain would be safer. Because if you have a distributed ledger um, that is encrypted, it might be harder to hack in and then people can vote from their phones and accounts for voter suppression and can increase the higher turnout, so we could shift elections in different ways. Um, but all that to say, this is still a new technology and it, sh it shouldn't just be like a green light, but we wanna at least start a process that explores that. And so those are three ideas that we have on the table, but the uh, goal um, is to continue organizing. And we wanted to start off with the FAST as a way to you know, call others to, to join us. And so we're talking with a few different groups right now to see what we can do. The municipal election is November, 2021. Um, so I know it sounds like a, a radical extension to the XR projects that we were talking about, but the reason why it's all put together is because XR, XR uh, it really stays at the core of what we're looking to do in terms of advocacy in communities, in terms of teachings with communities, in terms of empowering community organizations in different ways. And so our call is to use our augmented reality monuments in some ways um, as a new, uh, a new way to reimagine a new equitable city and to host demonstrations of public spaces in different ways. And so all of them are tied together. Um, so that's our goal. And so let's go to the next slide. Next slide. And that's it. So if you wanna learn more, our Instagram is at Movers and Shakers NYC. The middle one is me, bottom one is Idris in terms of Instagram, we're at moversandshakersnyc.com. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the vibes. Wonderful, thank you. The wonderful and amazing, inspiring and, and wonderful use of technology. Uh, it's it's uh, incredible. Um, 
I'm going to open this up to questions. Uh, I can't see the panelists. Uh, Claudia, if you want to make it so I can see all the panelists. Um, I guess I go to gallery view here. Excellent. Um, and let's see if there are questions for you. Um, William, I see you have a question. Yeah, I just want to amplify. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a space we're doing a lot of exploration of. And what I love about your project is um, not only its ability to rewrite the city and to, and to reinscribe absences back into the historical narrative, but the fact that there's a really articulated educational component and a civic action component. That's terrific. That's, that's, that's impressive. And I'm going to ask a really stupid, basic question, but to me, it's the sort of Achilles heel of AR, findability. You can load a lot of assets all over the place. You can use location or you can use image recognition, but how do you get people to see it, to know about it? And it looks like one of your techniques is performance, is sort of staging stuff in a public space so people will download the QR code and, and you know, maybe do something. But I'm, I'm interested in how you're thinking about findability. Yeah, so I think there's a short term and there's a long term answer to that. Um, we definitely don't have the secret sauce, so I just want to put that out yeah. there. Um, but in terms of findability, um, in the short term for us, number one, um, we're thankful that we have this partnership where we're going to be, um, by September 2021, we're slated to go out to 100 schools um, nationwide. Um, and we're we're also, we also are looking to create partnerships with different schools. So as far as like getting in the classroom, like that's going to be there and it's within our business model to try and just get into as many classrooms as possible. Um, from the public spaces perspective, in terms of short term, um, make a lot of noise, do a lot of demonstrations and see who's willing to do what, right? Um, and then the long-term answer, um, I'm sure it's questions you've explored as well as it's, it's really a hardware issue. Um, a hardware issue in the sense that right now, you know, it's opt in, no one wants to download an app um, and you got to do it through your phone. That's something, right? Um, but, you know, ultimately it will move to your glasses, it will move to windshields um, and it will become more seamless. And then from a software perspective, there's a lot of promise behind web AR, but it hasn't necessarily been figured out yet. Um, so I would say those are the, those are some of the challenges and ways that we're addressing those challenges. Um, but from a business perspective as well, one of the things that we're, that we're working on right now is we want to just get a bunch of our AR monuments and start testing out with as many kids as we can. Um, and so like with lean startup mode, it's like, you know, build something really quick, make it scrappy, see if it works and see who likes it, see who doesn't. So right now there's a lot of kids at home. There's a lot of teachers looking for content um, in terms of like educational content. So if we could just like, get a few of our monuments together, have a, have a few passages that we have and like reform that in a way where kids could start learning. We're looking for teachers yesterday. So this is obviously, it's also an ask. If anyone knows some, some teachers uh, that need content, um, within the next month, a little more than that, we'll have it ready. Excellent. Let me remind the audience, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat and we will, I will read it to Idris and Glenn. And just to let you know, Glenn and Idris, there is a comment that, um, from Patricia Maria Weinman who says, thank you so much for being with us today and for organizing your work as inspirational and I mind opening. Thank you. So wonderful. Do we have other questions from the panelists? Uh, Nadav? Kind of like more of a comment, just like thanking you again, reiterating a bit what William said about it. it's really wonderful to see the kind of scope and breadth and depth that you've, you're engaging with, with both the technology and the issues and how they're so interwoven together. Um, I love the fact that you're using kind of yourselves also and this kind of idea of very embodied kind of performance in public space together with those really disembodied technologies. Um, because I think, I think the two strengthen each other, right? Because, uh, and that could answer one of the means of engagement. And of course, educational space is a great other space to kind of use those tools. So I'm really curious to see what we go on there. So I wanted to thank you and I'll, I'll, I have some ideas and questions that I'll write to you guys. Uh, I have to go teach now. Thank you. 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 Th
Okay. Thank you. But thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait to continue talking. Yeah. Great. Um, looks like we do have one question first from an attendee. Um, I will read it out. Um, it is wonderful to see your passions for activism, art, and technology come together for social justice impact. And I'm so happy to see that you're bringing your work into schools. Is it challenging to break into school systems, especially ones that are not very diverse, because once experiencing an AR historical experience that is not typically shown in the textbooks, what if the teacher is not equipped, woke, level-wise to answer questions or introduce the issue? That is to say, I personally think many Americans in general need a re-education to recognize, for example, that the country was built upon racism, so how do you deal with the chance that this educational tool may not be properly used, interpreted, defended? And in any case, really cool to see your actions in these important issues. Well, I think um, for the educational component, that is something we're trying to make a solution out of the box that is gives the kids the opportunity to explore it on them on their own. I feel like we are trying to put the power uh, uh, of learning in the hands of the kids to explore it for themselves. And so the experiences combined with the readings that they're doing, we're trying to make it so that the students are the agents of their own learning, basically. And so I think we're trying to make it as easy as possible for the teachers to implement a lot of this into their classrooms. That's why we're doing a lot of our user research, a lot of teacher interviews. Um, to make it as seamless a, a, as possible so they could potentially just hand off the experience to their students and, le and let them go and let them run with it. But it is, it is also a problem if, if the students have questions and don't and the teacher's not equipped to handle it. Uh, that is something that we're wrestling with. But um, yeah, we're trying to make the students the agents of their own learning. So in terms of complicated questions, I think that's a, it's, it's an awesome question. I'm glad you brought this, brought this up first off. Um, the first obstacle that we see are the school administrators as gatekeepers to our learning. Um, not everyone's gonna like what we have to say, and that's fine. There are some that will, and there will be a demand for that. That's great. Um, now, even if we do get into the schools, it's a great point. So there are some teachers that might not actually have the tools. Um, and so the answer that we have for that is number one, like obviously nothing's going to be perfect. I think about the founding fathers, right? Like I said a lot of bad things about them before, but one thing they did get right was creating the constitution as a living, breathing document. And so right now it's me and Idris and Mike, another guy full time doing this and some contractors. So like the first iteration is, as Idris was saying, was just like to make an out of the box solution that works. But then over time, depending on how resources work out, we definitely need to bake in some sort of, um, like, you know, whether it's FAQs or an um, interactive platform or something where there's a resource where you have those woke folk that can answer with the appropriate nuance where the burden does not lay on the teacher. Because um, that will make things pretty complicated as well. And now the final aspect that we have to account for is, you know, that can become a, a Pandora's box. And with that Pandora's box, um, the teacher only really cares a lot of the time about hitting certain standards and then meeting that message. Um, so I guess the real question is how do we account for a Pandora's box feature? So we got to figure that out. Excellent. All right. Another question, Josh. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I mean, the whole kind of sweep of the presentation from, you know, the positioning of monuments and being such a contentious issue, issue today through the educational components was really great to see. I'm a professor in Arkansas, uh, a state that has so many Confederate monuments, and it's, uh, you know, it's a kind of a horrifying living issue that, you know, needs to be dealt with um, in a much more severe manner. So thank you so much for, for your work. I'm curious in, in how you sort of describing some of those case studies and some of the initial um, sort of AR, sort of digital mapping, digital New York experiences, some of the things that you've found. I mean, how have you been sort of documenting people's experiences? What have you been learning about how people have been sort of engaging with, with monuments in this new way? 
Um, and I just, yeah, I'm curious to see kind of what you've been learning, how you've sort of shifted maybe, or, or been thinking about um, your process based on what you've observed and how you've seen, um, yeah, sort of people thinking through different kinds of monuments in this new way. So to be clear, your question is specific to monuments or unsung as well? Yeah, I mean, just ha in, in terms of how you're thinking about sort of AR and monuments, how you've been sort of observing in terms of how people have been engaging with these apps and sort of AR in this way and how, yeah, kind of what you've been learning. Have you been sort of documenting people's experiences um, and how you're sort of incorporating that into your practice? Yeah, so um, first lay a foundation, the ways in which we've showed our monuments were through public demonstrations in the streets. We've shown them in um, different like festivals and corporate things. Um, and then we did a pop-up gallery uh, for Black History Month in 2019. Um, and then like in different ways in schools, right? So it all depends on the audience really. Um, so what we've learned so far is the biggest thing is that there's like craving for more interaction. And so like students, you know, they're used to playing video games um, created by studios with multi-million dollar budgets, right? So like whether it's Red Dead Redemption, Grand Theft Auto, you can live a whole life. Right now, due to our bandwidth, um, we can't really create a monument that turns into an entire character and is played out like a video game. So the biggest thing that we've learned is at least there's a demand for some sort of interaction that is deeper than just you look, you read, you understand. Um, so one of the things that's in our feedback loop right now is figuring out how to gamify it. So I spoke to Pokemon Go before, like Pokemon Go capitalized on the fact that there was this international uh, cultural success and they made a game out of it that everyone wanted to play, right? So our goal here is to teach these stories that we've been talking about in ways that are not accessible and how do we do that? So like the first step is just like, number one, figuring out how to gamify that, right? But the other challenge is also um, once we get to the appropriate part of like funding and resources, like securing that part goes to speaking with historians, speaking with the proper stakeholders and figuring out what stories need to be told. Um, but the reality is right now, like our focus and energy has just been in making sure that like the monuments themselves exist because we just got to make them, we have to fund them. But long-term, um, our answer is gamification and th figuring out incentives. I think um, also one of the interesting things that I feel that I think we've realized and have actually changed our process is how people, even though it's a digital experience, there's a connection between the digital and the physical world with AR. I feel like that's what makes a lot of this so great. But the connection a, a lot of times fools people. Like people will want to interact physically with the thing. They'll want to, they'll pick up the piece of paper, they'll twist it around. And once you do that, the, the model is kind of like moving with the piece of paper. And so this physical and digital connection has been something that, that people have been really honing in on. Um, and so we, they will touch our pieces. And so in a, in a gallery setting, especially we've moved towards having these little spinners um, on the bottom of our images and making sort of like a little square plaque. And so when people can, when people point at the image and see it, they can actually physically spin it, physically interact with the actual object. Uh, and through that, they'll shift what the digital experience looks like. And so that has been a extreme, uh, a really big connection for a lot of people. And so we brought that also into the classroom. And so for the version two of our unsung um, um, app, we're actually trying to think about using game cards as a way to facilitate puzzles. And, the, and if you take the game cards, put them together, the, the experience will shift in a way. And so we're really trying to play further with that, the offset between that digital and physical world and actually have those two things interact. Um, more than just looking at the image and having that spawn it. Like if you put two cards together, the, like someone will pop out of a house, something will happen inside of a room. And so we really want to further keep on blending these digital and physical worlds in our experiences because that's 
what bring that's what tricks the human brain and what tricks the users into feeling like it's actually real. We have two questions here from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Kevin Adweso, who has two questions. Uh, the history of people of color has always been told from a Western lens. How do you think virtual monuments change the way the history of people of color is portrayed? Um, why don't you answer that question first, and then there's another question from him. Sure. Um, so I think, look, when I was in high school, I was so tired of about learning about all, all these white dudes. I was just like, all right, again, 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 cool. Um, people have, people feel attachment and buy-in when they see themselves in a story. You look at the numbers that came out for Black Panther, and that speaks to the point right there. So I think that if we can equip people, storytellers with this type of content, then the way that it's going to be told is going to be dramatically different because the storytellers will be different. Right. And the, uh, another question from Kevin, through augmented reality, how are you able to enable certain objects move as you synchronize the image with the camera of a phone tablet? Example, in the Columbus picture you experimented on. Um, I, th that is, I think that's part of just the built-in functionality of something like Euphoria. I think they, it's a lot of careful positioning on the back end when you're in the program of Unity to make that happen. But all of the animation, all of the movement is built into that object. So as long as you make the connection of where the object is supposed to spawn and make sure that the object, the image, like the Columbus image that it's being spawned on top of, uh, correlates positionally exactly to the animation, it will, everything will look perfect and look at and move around just as if it's on top of that object. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's definitely how you make that happen. It's and it speaks to, it speaks to the first question that should always be asked as far as why augmented reality. Um, there was the, I uh, did the Apple AR art walk um, over the summer. And one of the, one, some, something that I thought was really cool was that this is a tree and you see the tree right there. Like you could point your phone in front of a tree and then you see a whole other world that exists within the tree. And it made sense as if it was like, like they lived inside of it, right? So to Idris's point, if you have animations in the back end that correlate with the physical world, it has your mind sort of play tricks and blends together really well. Great. Another question from Emily Hoffelick. I am a youth de development professional and want to find opportunities to expose our teens to this art form and explore the possibilities for activism. So excited about what you're doing with AR. What's the best way to keep track of what you're working on? Woo! Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, our Instagram is Movers and Shakers NYC. Um, you go to Movers and Shakers NYC. Dot com. If you go to the website, you can um, join our mailing list. Um, so yeah, those are those are the best ways where you could you could find out more. And as I said before, we're looking for we're looking specifically to speak to educators um, and to provide content for them. So if anyone's interested in that, reach out to us by all means. Great. We have a question here from Halsey Bergen. Uh, hi, I think I've unmuted myself. Um, this is this is fantastic. I'm loving hearing about your uh, project. I was just wondering, you've talked a bunch about um, interactions, and I'm wondering if you guys have uh, what you've thought about in terms of um, uh, not only interactions as you as you've talked about between um, participants and the monuments per se, but also between uh, different participants. You know, have you thought about uh, or what have you thought, I'm sure you thought about it some, about, um, you know, these monuments could be discussions starting places where people could, um, you know, uh, start discussions around the topics that the monuments are bringing up. Those discussions could happen asynchronously, you know, in that location, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just wondering if you've thought about those sorts of, you know, community building um, in that kind of way. Um, it seems like that it's probably something you guys have been tossing around. So I just thought I'd ask. Thank you. 
Yeah. Um, so the majority of the interactions that we built in are focused on unsung right now. Um, and it just comes from the reality of the fact that like, uh, because we're a social business, we got to keep the lights on first. And so the main grant is from Verizon, we got to do that first, right? Um, and so from that perspective, um, like the social, the social goal is basically going through what's kind of like an escape room. You're learning about these different characters. You can click into a room. Once you're inside of a room, you have six degrees of freedom. You're seeing different videos and pictures. We're exploring different puzzles, um, the different puzzles that relates to whether it's a tangential part of that figure's life or something that is relevant to the time that's being explored. Um, and the students are working through that together um, in different ways. But in terms of the monuments, um, right now, as I mentioned, we're just trying to make that happen in terms of like having actual content to produce, and then we'll have the time to explore those questions. But I think those are really interesting ideas. And if you want to speak more, to, uh, if you haven't you'd like to brainstorm, we're, we're open to it. Got to unmute myself. <laughs> um, looks like we have time for one more question. Um, is there are there any further questions from either the panelists or uh, any of the audience people? Okay. Uh, William, did you look like you might have been asking something? Or no? It looks like we have another question in the Q&A section. Um, someone asked, how open are you to collaborating on extended educational tools? Very open. It will do it. Yeah. Very open to collaboration. We would love to. Great. If you just reach out to us um, through our mailing list or through Instagram, or we can give our email somehow, um, that would be great. Well, that was a wonderful way to end <laughs> collaboration. So thank you so much that your work is so inspiring and thoughtful and thank you for sharing it with us today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Well, it wasn't be there in person, but this is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs>